feminists really like the book right up until the last chapter on marriage and conservatives really like the marriage chapter. Let's just tear the book between the two groups. <laughs> and then everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. Hello and welcome to Women with Balls, where I, Katie Balls, speak to today's trailblazers. My guest this week is a writer and campaigner whose recent book, A Case Against the Sexual Revolution, offers a new guide to sex in the 21st century. Porn is to sex as McDonald's is to food. Seen by some as conservative feminist thinking, it was described by The Guardian as one of the most important feminist books of its time. Rather than herald the sexual revolution as a good thing for women everywhere, she argues that these freedoms have actually led to problems. Well, you don't exactly have this kind of service at home. She has piled into multiple feminist debates, voicing her gender-critical views, why she believes marriage is good for women and why it's time to turn back the clock on sex, pornography and prostitution. As a campaigner, my guest became a press officer for the campaign group We Can't Consent to This, which documents cases where women have been killed in rough sex. In 2022, she co-founded a think tank, The Other Half, a non-partisan organisation that champions the voices of women and families not heard in Westminster. Currently seen as carving out her own counter-feminist movement, she believes where Beyonce goes, we all follow. That's a credit to Spectator TV. Let's take, for example, Beyonce, a great feminist icon. Where Beyonce goes, I suppose we all follow. If you like it, you should have put a ring on it. My guest today is Louise Perry. Hello. <laughs> Um, so thanks for coming on this podcast today. Um, we always begin by asking what I have been told in the past is a loaded question, which is, would you describe yours as a happy childhood? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah. Um, and not only because my parents will watch it, though they probably will. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, also very boring. I, I often get, <clears throat> I always feel like I'm really shortchanging people when I'm asked to talk about my upbringing because it's so extremely conventional I grew up in London um, I guess the only thing that's interesting is that I come from a, like an extremely guardian reading sort of background um, at one point we got two guardians a day I really just be, just because it had to go round or because my dad took one to work and then I would take part of it to school and my mum would keep the rest which sections would you go for G2 do you remember the yeah, days this was Alan Rusbridge a Berliner kind of era of the guardian um whereas now my parents only get the guardian at the weekend so make of that what you will so that's that's kind of the only like thing that's interesting i suppose in the sense that i've now become i mean i don't know i'm a bit reluctant to call myself a conservative but a lot of other people do um you said from the age of 11 you were listening to radio 4 um so <laughs> I don't remember saying that but it is true yeah go on <laughs> maybe someone just found it out <laughs> i've read it online um so if we're thinking about guardian two guardians a day radio yeah. 4 moral maze yeah yeah were you very aware of current affairs and politics early on or, or what was it oh yeah hugely i've always been a news junkie yeah. And d did you end up having, I suppose, lots of discussions with your parents around the dinner table about things like this? Did they encourage it? Or? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I have since become, um, I guess, a shade more conservative than my parents, but not that, not hugely so. We don't disagree on anything really substantial. But yeah, it was a very, um, very like discoursey breakfast table. <laughs> um, are you an only child? No, I have a younger brother. Okay, fine. So it all went debates. Um, and then I was going to ask you, I mean, you went on to study at university anthropology and women's studies. And of course, we're here today because of the book you have. At what point, I suppose, were you thinking about gender um, in terms of growing up when you decided to obviously go and study women's studies? And um, so I sort of got... Um, so I don't write about this, this in the book deliberately, although I have written about it elsewhere. I... The trans issue was quite formative for me in the sense that I was at um, SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies at the time, which is an extremely left-wing university. I actually wrote a piece about it for The Spectator years and years ago, um, if anyone wants to dig that out. Um, and I kind of privately came to the conclusion that the trans activism as it was, I mean, this was in the days when really the only person who was talking about this was Julie Bindle. Like, it was completely impossible to say anything critical of trans activism in public. Um, and I decided privately that the whole thing was insane. And that, for me, was, like, quite an important moment in terms of 
being willing to believe things that no one around me believed I guess even if only privately yeah and were you having conversations with people about the time on just not really actually, no. no not really at all so um I mean I'm I, I now kind of make no pretense of thinking anything else but um yeah that I think that was I mean for me I think the reason that that was important was because it was that moment of like hang on if this thing if, if progressives are wrong about this thing what else might they be wrong about and even though it took quite a few years for me to then conclude you know that the sexual revolution was actually somewhat terrible for instance um I think that that was the first domino and during this period are you I suppose like think of the t-shirt this is what a feminist looks like but are you describing yourself as a feminist or yeah. yeah so I was I I mean so I I initially was drawn to radical feminism um because that was um that was the group of women who were being who were critical of the excesses of trans activism um like Julie in fact who I who I, who I first met at this stage in my life um and so radical feminism was kind of the obvious thing to go and read about. It was the, it was the obvious counter to the mainstream. Um, and I'm still good friends with radical feminists and, and sort of we, we've reached many of the same conclusions on all sorts of issues like porn, prostitution, whatever. But um, I, don't, I don't subscribe to the belief system anymore. And after university, you went to work in a rape crisis centre. Uh, what led you to do that? Well, I was volunteering there at the time when I was studying and then um, a job came up. So it was it was slightly coincidental in that sense because it was just a, like a natural thing to go and do once I finished studying. Um, and also because I felt strongly about it and it's, you know, it's good, important work. I almost stayed in the charity sector. That was that was my that was my alternative life course that I would have just worked in charities for for years. Um, I ended up being a journalist slightly accidentally. And um, why did you leave the charity sector then, if it was potentially the long time route? I just didn't like the work culture there. I mean, I'm not, I guess, maybe not coincidentally, given the, all the sort of controversial stuff I write about, I'm not, I don't really like, I'm not a very good joiner in her. <laughs> if that makes sense <laughs> like I don't I I, I, I find it I, I find it really grating to have to sort of tow ideological lines and you do have to do that in a lot of sectors and definitely the charity sector um so, so like what not the, say your full, full views or yeah, yeah um be very conformist in all sorts of different ways like one of the reasons I didn't want to stay at the organization I was at is that the there was a move to it had been women only for years and years and there was a move to to allow men to use the service as well um which I just thought was a really stupid idea and because for the because of the risk to abuses of the service and stuff like that um and I yeah I just sort of grew tired of having to um play off as politics and so on and you mentioned obviously the move to journalism but were you always writing growing up or or, or getting into debates with people or was it more I suppose um introspective uh I was extremely ins- insufferable but I that was my polite way of putting it um and I yeah I was like a school debater and all this kind of stuff but I um I didn't um I, I did always sort of privately hope that one day I might I might make a living as a writer or might be a writer um but I would never say so to anyone it was like the most if I felt like it was the most embarrassing thing to admit because it seems such an unrealistic thing to want to do so privately yeah but I would never have dreamed that I'd now be making a living doing this um now for our listeners uh, only a small portion of course who don't know about your writing <laughs> um I wanted to, just to begin could you I suppose uh, you talked about radical feminism. Where do you align as a feminist now? H- how would you explain it to someone? Oh, I don't know what the I don't know what the name is. I mean, the uh, so some people would say I'm a conservative feminist. Um, Post liberal feminist is another term. Um, uh, Kathleen Stock, who wrote the forward for my book, she she talks about materialist feminism, which I quite like. Um, what does that mean? Well, it's a bit too academic, isn't it? That's the problem with that term, but. Um, Basically starting from the recognition that men and women are really profoundly different 
in important ways and that any kind of feminist politics has to has to negotiate those differences rather than trying to erase them i'd say would be the, the crucial distinction between um what i'm now trying to do and other forms of feminism not all but you know the mainstream view um mary harrington who's a friend of mine she um she she calls it reactionary feminism which is like kind of a joke but also kind of not a joke it's actually quite good <laughs> kind of sticks so i don't know i think it's not up to me to describe exactly what it is because i don't think i get a choice in the matter but um yeah i mean i end up i start with feminist priors basically and i end up at some conservative conclusions like i am pro-marriage for instance which is a which is a really unusual position but um we've touched on your book very lightly um the case against the sexual revolution could you i suppose could you just start by telling me what is uh, sex positivity and what is the case against it uh so the, the 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 kind of generous description of it is that it's um uh about challenging old-fashioned ideas around sex which are sort of needlessly distressing to people you know saying that actually there, there isn't any reason to be ashamed of perfectly benign things like I don't know, masturbation or same-sex relationships or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. And um, and particularly about women sort of reclaiming their own sexuality and not being, you know, like there, there, is, a, there is a completely um, benign and persuasive version of sex-positive feminism I don't have a problem with. The problem, I think, is that in practice what sex-positive feminism ends up doing is making excuses for um, a kind of sexual culture which actually favours male preferences not female and encouraging women to imitate male sexuality in a way that is actually really harmful to women and do you think that goes back so that the problem with the sexual revolution is that it paved the way for this rather than more in women's terms or well i think what the sexual revolution did is well i mean sort of two things right so there's the material dimension to the sexual revolution which is the which is the pill which is the the crucial innovation to my mind it's this massive technology shock which suddenly allows women to control their reproduction in a way they've never have done before it's why we call it the pill capital p you know like is that big a deal so there's that there's also the ideological stuff that comes with it because this is all happening at the same time as the um the rejection of christianity really is i think what we should be that's what actually happens in the 60s right which uh, there are so many other ways in which we talk about it but i think it is it should almost be understood you know so, some historians now are starting to think of it as being almost like a second reformation you know that level of ideological break with the past where everything associated with tradition which means any association with christianity has to be questioned thrown out the window etc including when it comes to sexual ethics so we end up in a situation where um any kind of limitations on freedom are up for contestation and um the only framework or, 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 or sort of ethical system left standing is the consent one you say as long as everyone's consenting and is able to consent there's no problem and all other norms whatever have to go out the window and I think what you know having seen that played out now for more than half a century what what's ended up happening is a drift back towards a system of sexual ethics which favors men a minority of men i don't think that this is like all men are having a marvelous time post sexual revolution they're clearly not like it's not it's not nice to be like stuck in your mum's basement watching porn or whatever like miserable outcome many men are experiencing um it's a minority of men who are i describe them in the book as the hugh heffernans of the world the guys who are really attractive love being promiscuous love having consequence free sex obviously love the pill obviously love the decriminalization of abortion like it like it can, the whole sort of supposedly sex positive culture hugely serves their interests and they're able to basically just consume women in the way that you would consume any sort of like any any commodity um and i would say that that triumph of the hugh hefners has been falsely represented as a as a feminist victory when it is nothing of the sort 
So when I suppose you're looking at the sexual revolution and we're talking a bit about a sort of rejection of Christ- Christian values, say, but also the pill, do you see some positive developments in that? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's some of the things that just sprung from that later down the line that are problematic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a kind of... I, f- I have complex feelings towards Christian sexual ethics, right? Because there are ways in... And looking at the really long sweep of history here, right? I think... Uh, there's this popular narrative which I really want to challenge, which is basically that, putting it really crudely, up until up until five minutes ago, all of our ancestors were just really sort of stupid and ignorant and 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 malign, and people just suddenly woke up in the 1960s and decided we've been doing it all wrong, and, and now you know, like now we're on the like long march towards progressive triumph. I think that's I think that's nonsense. I think that most of what's changed women's lives everyone's lives has been to do with technology has been to do with material change the fact that our economy is wildly different than it used to be you know women can participate in public life in ways that we couldn't previously partly because of things like washing machines and tampons and do you know what I mean like the the story has so much more to do with the practicalities of day-to-day life than it has to do with ideology although there is the ideological current as well um and if you look at like the whole long sweep of of sexual ethics and look at you know don't just think about the 1950s versus that I get so annoyed people talking about back to the 1950s whatever like as if the world didn't exist before the 1950s which is actually a very peculiar decade um you know when christian sexual ethics arrive in the roman world they are it's incredibly radical right the idea that men should not have unquestioned access to prostitutes for instance in a slave society where buying sex is incredibly cheap. The idea that high status Roman men shouldn't be sexually abusing their slaves and their social inferiors, you know. This is the kind of thing that Christian sexual ethics arose to challenge and should be understood as a first sexual revolution in that sense. And was very much in many ways in women's interest. And the reason that early many early Christians were women and the reason that Nietzsche described Christianity as a religion of women and slaves is because it did serve women's interests in all sorts of important ways in challenging that kind of... So I, I write in the book about the fact that male and female sexuality are should kind of be understood as two bell curves in terms of interest in having casual sex, buying sex, whatever. All the kind of... Um, the trait that psychologists call sociosexuality. Men are higher towards the socio, like the higher end of the sociosexuality scale than women are, with with plenty of overlap. What the first sexual revolution of, of the first century should be understood as doing is basically obliging men to match the female bell curve, if that makes sense. Like, for, you have to be monogamous. You have to. You can't have extramarital sex. You can't. You know, you can't buy sex. All of this stuff is all to do with encouraging men to behave more like women whereas our sexual revolution has been doing the opposite is encouraging women to behave more like men and I think for all of the for all of the downsides of the Christian system which include you know the fact that women end up being shamed publicly for not being chaste um, the fact that Christians have quite weird ideas about the unborn child, like most cultures are, are much more relaxed about abortion than Christians are, right? Um, all of that stuff has all sorts of negative repercussions for women. And I think that there have been, we definitely reap benefits from having thrown that system out. At the same time, I almost think that what's happening now is we're almost reverting to a more Roman system, if that makes sense, right? Where actually the high status men have basically can do what they want you know they've got tinder they've got the whole world of the sex industry freely available to them and so on i think that what i'm trying to what the argument i'm trying to make in the book is that there have been trade-offs and some of those trade-offs are really really painful do you find it's quite an unfashionable argument to make amongst some of your friends or or actually how does it go down have you been accused of, and i do think for like you know serena joy type figure <laughs> <laughs> like trying to push me back to the fifth. Do you get much of that? No one's explicitly accused me of being Serena Joy, but I like, I like the today, reference. So. <laughs> um, uh, not as much as you'd think. Yeah, but I mean, a bit, yeah. Um, I got, um, when I was doing We Can't Consent to this stuff and talking and like talking about things like um, why choking is not a good thing 
tr- like sexual fashion. Um, I got I, I get called vanilla and prude and la 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 on Twitter, but that's just Twitter. Um, in general, no, it's been like ninety five percent positive. So much more than I thought. I thought I might get raked over the coals a bit for this book, but no. And have you had people get in touch and having read the book and old me say it chimes actually a lot, perhaps a lot all the time, like yeah. several times a day. Yeah, it's amazing. Lots of people say um, something like, I've thought this privately all this time and I didn't really feel like I could say it publicly, which is nice. Um, You had a piece in the mail, uh, which I think, and obviously I'm a journalist, no one gets to pick the headlines, Um, (laughs) but it had the headline, get married and do your best to stay married. Yeah. I suppose not to dwell too much on reaction things, but how does that meet I think what people say to that because obviously it's become quite fashionable in a way to almost think marriage is a bit too traditional too in the past it limits women Mm -hmm. it what's the reaction mean like to that generally the reaction is that um feminists really like the book right up until the last chapter on marriage and conservatives really like the marriage chapter and then have more misgivings about the other bits of it um I mean what I what just let's just tear the book between the two groups <laughs> and then everyone's happy everyone's happy um and I mean the argument that I'm making for marriage is not one it, it's not coming from religious principles it's not coming from just this is tradition therefore it's good sort of principles it's I try and make it a very kind of data driven argument which is that there are all sorts of ways in which um married people fare better you know um financially socially health-wise whatever particularly children do so much better in households where both parents are there we know that married people are less likely to break up than non-married people etc etc comparing cultures where um polygamous cultures for instance versus monogamous cultures which are which are the only two options by the way there's no like fantasy land where women have loads of husbands and they're they're loving it right that the options you have to choose from are basically those two um and seeing that the monogamous cultures do better on all sorts of metrics including things like lower domestic violence rates lower child abuse rates you know there's a there's a really really strong argument to be made just from the numbers that people fare better when marriage is the norm and abandoning it as a norm has I mean, I completely concede that there are some marriages that really do need to end and that domestic violence, you know, it is is clearly a terrible thing when women are trapped in in marriages with violent husbands and they can't get out legally. It's also worth bearing in mind that women who are unmarried are actually much more at risk of domestic violence than women who are married now. It's like the relationship is really not that close. And the downside of having the the, the loss of the institution has overwhelmingly be born by mothers and children and I think the thing that I'm accused of sometimes by some um, feminists including feminist friends is being defeatist and kind of not not wanting to just completely overhaul masculinity and feminine femininity as such and and seeking out the kind of pragmatic compromise positions like for instance yes marriage has all these all these problems all these trade-offs but actually we've not yet found anything better we've tried like experimental communitarian stuff of communes all this kind of whatever we've tried um completely doing away with marriage and and basically ending up with huge numbers of single mothers who are dependent on the state to some degree none of these have worked you know, if if I my my view is, and if it's a defeatist view, then so be it. That what we actually have to choose from as a culture are systems that have actually existed and have actually succeeded in real life, not imagined alternatives that have never actually been tried. We can all design like society on on the back of an envelope and think that this would be amazing. It's like a classic sort of undergrad PPE is to think to do right, like come up with come up with like the perfect social system. Um, and think you can impose it on people. I don't think you can. I think actually what you've really got to choose from is is a very small and very flawed set of options. Now, you've said you never voted Tory and yeah. was talking about the two Guardian yes. a day yes. households. Um, <laughs> do, do you feel, 
that the left is welcoming to some of the views because obviously if you take away like the bullet points from what you're just saying mm-hmm. I think it would look much more at home on a kind of conservative thinking manifesto do, do you mean the, than what you'd expect at a left wing rally uh yeah in general I've had I've had more positive attention from the right than from the left although I'm not I'm definitely not chummy with the like small state conservatives by any means and the and the the, the like the, the the free market end of the the really very libertarian wing of the conservative party is absolutely this trust is not your person <laughs> <laughs> we'll see she's been making promises on uh, on family taxation which i hope she lives up to but um yeah i mean that the i i guess where i'm at politically nowadays is probably like culturally right economically left that kind of quadrant which is a very popular quadrant among voters. Yeah, I think that's almost where Boris Johnson was in 2019. I suppose but. so, yeah. Although he really needs to read my book. Yeah, you should send him a copy. Maybe I should. He's got time on his hands now. Um, <laughs> just, I'm trying to talk about your new ventures, so think, Dan. But just before we do, I wondered, have you had any, I suppose, figures or movements embrace some of the arguments you're making in a way that's made you feel uncomfortable? Um, just in the sense that we're obviously talking about how obviously there's always more nuance to things. Like, they can seem so it's you're you're not saying as far as i understand you know everything that came with the sexual revolution and some of this mm. was, was a bad thing mm-hmm. but of course when you're talking about some things such as being pro-marriage uh you know units together obviously you can attract people who want to use that argument to advance their agenda has there been anything like that um those groups tend to actually uh get a bit annoyed with me because they think i've not been I've, they, they think i've not gone far enough um, it is true that I have had more, generally a more positive reception on the right than on the left, with the exception of things like a very nice review in The Observer and so on. Um, but I kind of just, I'll take it, you know, whoever's, I mean, I, I, I think that there is just as much of a misogynist streak on the right as on the left. I think it's completely even to be honest, you know, that for, I think it's Andrew Dworkin who said that um, um, the right considers women to be private property, the left considers them to be public property. You know, there's, I, I, I really can't put a piece of paper between, between right and left in terms of like the record on women. Um, and I do actually think, maybe we'll talk about this in relation to the other half, that um, feminism is leaving the left it's always historically been associated with the left. And to some extent, like second wave feminism comes out of um, left-wing movements of the 60s. Although always in tension, always always conflict on various fronts. Um, I think now that that isn't, I think increasingly that's not the case. And I think actually, it's not that feminism is joining the right per se. I think it's more that it's slightly orthogonal to the right, the left-right distinction. Um, we saw that, for instance, with all the conflict over the Gender Recognition Act in this country, which was the reforms were initially proposed by a conservative government and then they ended up being rescinded by a conservative government as well. You know, you had you had proponents and opponents across the House. There wasn't really a correlation with party affiliation. Ditto with things like newspapers. You know, you had the Morning Star being really turfy and then you had plenty of, like, libertarian conservatives who were really pro these reforms. So I think that... And what came out of that, the like grassroots feminist response to that, which came out of groups like Mums Net, which was very much, um, like, I think it's absolutely no coincidence that mothers are particularly hostile to the kind of radical end of trans activism, which says that there are there are no distinctions between men and women, that all this biological sex is a construct, whatever. Like, if you've pushed a person out of your vagina, you just you're just not like at home to that kind of argument. Um, and it's, I'm really interested to see where that goes, that grassroots movement, because I, I, I don't think it's going to be like singing from the same hymn sheet as progressives on everything. Now, you mentioned your think tank. Yes. Um, so it's the other half. Um, you founded it recently. Very recently, or co-founded yeah. it. And we're, we're speaking in Westminster, but the point of the think tank is to get voices outside of Westminster can you tell us more so there's a really big goal I mean this is this is this shouldn't be news to to, to most people who, who follow politics but there's a there's a gap on all sorts of things including on feminist issues between what voters tend to say what 
what voters tend to tell pollsters and what tends to be considered sort of consensus within Westminster. Um, one example, I mean, one example would be Gender Recognition Act, which was which was the reforms were pushed by all sorts of elite voices and you know academia, media, whatever was 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 full of resounding support for this. Like even the no debate thing, hashtag no debate. You know that the idea that this was like not even up for discussion. Whereas actually we know that that was absolutely not the position among like normie mums. Um, it's also true on things like family policy. You know the 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 standard view among feminists in Westminster is that the solution to the problem of negotiating work and motherhood is more daycare, universal daycare hours, encouraging women to get back into the office as quickly as possible, um, basically severing the physical link between mothers and children as quickly as possible so that women can get back to work. We know that most women don't want that. And actually the, the, the proportion of mothers who who consider their career to be more, I mean, most women don't have careers, first of all, like most women have jobs, consider their career or their job to be more important than their than their family is a, quite a small minority. It is, however, by definition, a minority who tend to predominate in, er- in areas in areas of public life where being a, mo- being a mother is a massive disadvantage. And mothers will tend to kind of fall, fall by the wayside as time goes by and it becomes impossible for them to negotiate both roles simultaneously. Um, what most women want, what most mothers and fathers tell pollsters they want, is to be able to have more choice to spend more time at home and just maybe work part-time, work flexibly, take periods out when their children are little. You know, not necessarily absent the workplace. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm really not saying we go back to a period where women were, were restricted from entering public life. Um, apart from anything else, I'd be a terrible hypocrite to say that. But this idea that being like a man in every possible way, right? Imitating the masculine role, whether that be in, in terms of sexuality or in terms of professional life, is the obvious way of improving women's lives. I just don't accept that premise. Um, I think actually there's a lot to be said for actually saying that, you know, the feminine, the domestic, the other half of life actually has as much virtue and is, it should be considered as valuable as the masculine sphere and that the job of feminism is not just about kind of breaking down the barriers to give women access to that sphere it's about protecting the welfare of women and their children more generally do you remember labor's pink bus do you remember this oh, harriet dear, harman had me. one <laughs> back when ed miliband was leader and harriet harman went on the road in a pink bus to talk about women's issues it just made me think when you're talking and everyone <laughs> went absolutely mental and was like this is a disgusting version of like you know patronizing to women what they want but no i just wondered if you had any thoughts on the pink bus. i completely forgot about the pink bus yeah i do try really hard not to sort of have pink too much it was my only my only request about the book cover was that it not be pink and my only request about branding for the other half was that it not be pink so focus on women's issues good but just not pink well just because people make assumptions i personally love the color pink and will happily wear the color pink but um Um, (laughs) final question is when we ask everyone on this podcast which is just what is the worst advice you've ever been given whether you took it or just ignored it straight away I, so I got um, married unusually young. I mean, unusually young in, um, not historically. How young are we talking? I got engaged when I was 24 and married when I was 25. Oh, yes, yeah. So in like the 1980s, that was completely, that was average. But now the average age of marriage has gone up a lot. Um, and I had a friend at the time when I got engaged to my now husband who said that I was making a terrible error and I, my 20s were for like shagging as many people as possible. And I did think at the time, like, oh, no, I wonder if she's right. But I obviously didn't obey her advice. So, anyway, that was my worst piece of advice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you for joining us today.